Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 22 of my beta campaign. We actually have three brand new spacecraft coming your way in this particular episode. Uh, a little bit later we'll be getting uh, a spacecraft that will be doing a setting itself up for a rendezvous with a near Kerbin asteroid and seeing if we can uh, set up a capture and get it into Kerbin orbit. Uh, at the end of this episode, we got my very first fully reusable single stage to orbit vertical takeoff spacecraft. Uh, so uh, hopefully you're looking forward to seeing that. But right here, what we have is Kanata Station underneath this gig ginormous fairing. Uh, and Kanata Station is on its way to the moon. Now I thought you know, um, since this station is going out to the moon and not to low Kerbin orbit, I thought I'd sort of put more of it together uh, and get it out there with fewer trips. So there's actually sort of three components to this thing. There's a habitat module in the middle. There's this sort of antenna array, as well as solar panels and uh, radiators that are at the top that I'll distribute or extend, sorry, once uh, we are out of the Kerbin atmosphere. Um, and then in the middle part, I have a kind of a docking module with a total of five docking ports coming off of it. And I, I use the uh, modular girders to give it a little bit more of an industrial look. Now, the contract was to have uh, this thing be able to support five kerbals. So what I did, because the habitat module, of course, only supports four kerbals, is I put a one-man landing can up there at the top of the habitat module and I just sort of figured you know that'll make it five and then then I can satisfy the contract and I won't have to send anybody out there just yet um, I think my eventual plan for this thing is to actually attach a lander to it and some extra fuel cans and use it to um, as kind of a, a support base to when I get around to mining the rest of the science out of the moon. But if you recall from last episode, I've maxed out my tech tree for now until I manage to upgrade the research and development center. So mining science really isn't high on my priority list. So I just want to kind of get this thing into orbit and then I'll deal with it later. And so here we are performing our insertion burn uh, to get into our lunar orbit. Uh, Canada, by the way, is not a play on Canada, which some people might think of as a kerbalization of Canada. It's actually the name of a 6th century BC Hindu philosopher, which uh, was one of the who was one of the first people to come up with the idea of the atom that if you break down material down to you know if you keep chopping a material down that you get to a final indestructible uh, quantity. Um, the Greeks also came up with that idea, uh, and there is some debate as to who came up with that idea first. Um, Personally, I just couldn't resist once I once I've discovered this person named Canada, and I'm from Canada, and you know, put a K in front of Canada, and I couldn't resist using the name. So there it is. So if you want to think of it as a verbalization of Canada, you can go ahead and do that. Anyway, so um, anyway, after sort of very carefully putting this thing into orbit, and you know, about a 50 kilometer orbit, and, and tweaking my inclination right down to zero, I started thinking about it afterwards and thinking, you know what? Um, I think I might want to have this thing actually in an inclined orbit because the idea is is, is that I will have a lander attached to it and uh, that lander is going to be having to land in a variety of biomes and if you put your station into an inclined orbit that means that it will be going over um, far more of a range of the surface of the planet and it will be easier to put your spacecraft down in different locations, most importantly at different latitudes, if you have your sp uh, station in an inclined orbit. So I think I will probably come back to this uh, once I get around to using it, <laughs> that uh, I'll probably put it into a, a bit of an inclined orbit. Thankfully, there's still tons of fuel left on the transfer stage, so I'm going to leave the transfer stage attached for now. But uh, I'm going to, you know, with the contract done, I think I'm going to put this puppy to bed and move on to something else. And that something else is the Aryabhata A. And the mission plan here is a rendezvous with an A-class asteroid 
and to uh, bring it into, capture it into a curve in orbit. So um, what we got to do, I'm going to pick my asteroid, then we're going to go out, and you can see that my closest encounter is uh, quite a ways from Kerbin, so that's going to make this a little bit more expensive. It's nice if the close encounter is really nice and close to Kerbin, that makes it actually easier. But uh, you can see here, this one's quite a ways out. Now, in order to maximize the efficiency of this, you need to sort of launch in the right direction and at the right inclination. And, and this, if it comes in nice and close and crosses the plane of curve, and that's, that usually makes it easiest. This one you can see is quite a ways out. So the first thing I want to do is time warp so that my launch is kind of tangential, tangential, <laughs> a tangent to um, the path that the asteroid is going to follow through Kerbin's atmosphere. So I'm kind of coming out here so that I can launch in the right direction. And then the other thing I want to take a look at is the inclination. Now this takes a fair degree of kind of eyeballing. I look at it and I'm estimating that I need to launch about 10 degrees towards the south. That's sort of my eyeball estimate. So I'm going to launch at a heading of, well normally it's 90 degrees, 10 degrees to the south, add that on, and that's going to be a heading about 100 degrees. And that's my kind of best guess at to what direction I want to go. Now, to escape Kerbin's sphere of influence, takes about 950 meters per second. Um, you shouldn't need much more than that because all of these asteroids are in an orbit that's pretty close to Kerbin's orbit, but you are going to need, you know, it's good to bank, um, you know, some inefficiencies in this and there's some orb, uh, velocity matching that you're going to do. So I like to bank about 1500 meters per second to get out there and rendezvous with the asteroid. And then it's going to take, you know, some to get it that capture, probably about the same to get the capture again around Kerbin. Um, but you have to take into account as well that you will then also have the asteroid attached to it. Uh, an A-class asteroid has about an upper mass of about five tons. That's about the upper range of it. They're not very big. So you've got to sort of imagine that an extra five tons is going to be on the spacecraft. That makes sort of the the, the, the planning for, for these types of missions, I think some of the, the tougher things to plan for when it comes to, uh, to planning your missions for in KSP. And now that we are in low curb and orbit, it's time for us to start to set up our rendezvous. So I start with a prograde burn. I just pick a spot and set up a prograde burn. And I started off at about 1,000 meters per second because that should... That'll be enough to get me just outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence, so it seems like a good first guess. And then, of course, I start playing with the timing and taking a look at my closest approach. And, of course, this is going to take a little bit of playing around with the amount of prograde and with the timing of it. But I end up with eventually with a closest encounter of 14,000 kilometers with a prograde burn of 900 meters. 80 meters per second. Now, now that's not bad. Um, in fact, that's coming out to be pretty good. The, the reason why I'm off as far as I am is because uh, where my closest encounter is is going to be south of where the asteroid will be at that time. Um, and that's happening because uh, I should have launched into a little bit more of an inclined orbit. But remember, when I picked that inclination, there was quite a degree of eyeballing going on. So the fact that I'm a little bit off is hardly surprising. And all that's going to mean is I'm going to be doing a normal correction burn. So I set up a second node. And one of the great things about precise node is it allows you to really easily bounce between the two nodes that you can be working with two nodes at the same time. And of course, this normal correction is going to be done away from the periapsis. Remember, you want to do these correction burns out sort of mid-course where your velocity will be quite a bit less, and so the, these, these uh, correction burns will have more of an effect on your eventual trajectory. And of course this one's going to take a little bit of playing around with the amount of normal and the amount and the timing of the burn, but I eventually get my closest encounter down to uh, about 130 kilometers with a normal burn of 48 meters per second. And you know, that, that's pretty good for now. I, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time playing around with this because Inevitably, I will not be able to do this first burn perfectly, and uh, I'll end up having to tweak the correction again anyway. And while we perform these burns, why don't we talk a little bit about who Aryabhata was. Aryabhata was an Indian, Eastern Indian of course, uh, 6th century AD mathematician and astronomer. His mathematical text actually was instrumental in 
development of Hindu mathematics and hence our mathematics because one of the things uh, he, is, he was instrumental in establishing was a place value number system with a zero in being used in the appropriate way um, that became the standard for in uh, in uh, Indian mathematics and became you know the Arabic numeral system and the numeral system that we uh, inherited today. He also did a lot of work in establishing trigonometry, uh, in calculating the value of pi to a great degree of accuracy, and quite a lot more. And his text, what was most important is that is the text that he wrote, the original actually survived and was used as a standard reference for centuries in India. Um, but I want to talk about as, as astronomy, of course, just being Kerbal Space Program. And um, his model for the solar system was still a geocentric model for the solar system with the Earth in the center and then the Moon and the Sun going around it. But then what he had is he had the planets going around the Sun. So the Earth he still felt was stationary, but the planets themselves went around the Sun, which if you start to think about it, if you think about motion relativity, relatively, you know, it's not that different really from the model that we currently have today, you know, with the sun stationary instead of the earth. Um, you had the planets orbiting the sun in the right order. Um, he correctly explain eclipses. He understood that the moon and the planets shone because of reflected sunlight. And there was even some evidence to suggest that uh, he thought his orbits were ellipses rather than perfect circles. And with that correction burn done, it'll Final bit of tweaking using a little bit of RCS. I got that encounter down to about 20 kilometers, about a little over 14 days from now. You might have noticed I actually, in in the in the maneuver before, after I did a further correction, I added a little bit of radialness to it to sort of get that encounter down as close as we can. So that encounter is going to be 14 days from now. So uh, we'll set up an alarm and we will revisit this ship then. For now, it's time to get to the final mission of this video. Uh, this is the Somayaji, and the Somayaji is another autonomous vehicle. I haven't had any Kerbals in this particular video, but this this particular one is a single-staged orbit, vertical takeoff, as you can see, um, vessel. So the idea here is that it's going to get into low Kerbin orbit with its payload. You'll see its payload in just a little bit. It'll release its payload, which will go off and do its its own thing, and then uh, it will return back with the idea of landing it as close as we can to the Kerbal Space Center with the aid of a few parachutes and with the help of uh, whatever fuel is remaining in those engines. The idea being, of course, that this will hopefully provide me with a nice cheap way to get low mass payloads into low Kerbin orbit. But half the length of this thing is, is just for payloads. So now that we're in the upper part of the atmosphere, it's time to open the payload doors up. I like these. These come from uh, B9 Aerospace, I'm pretty sure. And we'll, we'll raise this antenna too so that we can remain in contact with the Kerbal Space Center. And now you can start to get a little bit of a look at the payload inside. This is JunkSat 12. JunkSat 12 is on its way to the moon for another satellite to be putting around the moon to fill a couple contracts. One of the contracts being to put a uh, orbital research scanner around the moon and then another contract to transmit some science back from the moon. Uh, I also put on a uh, thermometer because uh, you keep getting these uh, low altitude orbit scans about the moon. So I thought I'd put a thermometer on there. So if I got another one of the missions, I can I can use this satellite to pick up some more of those temperature scan missions. You may be noticing that that Communitron's uh, quite a bit longer than the standard Communitron. This is the Communitron 32 the, uh, that comes with the Remote Tech mod. Uh, and it has a range that's twice the range of the Communitron 16. It can, it can pick up. It has a range of 5,000 kilometers. So that's, that's great. It'll be a little bit easier for these satellites to all remain in contact with each other. Give us a more of a, a larger communication sphere. So anyway, we send this probe on its way. Uh, it's not doing anything too exciting. It's, I'm going to put it into a polar orbit around the moon so that I will be able to get it to go over whatever surface I might want to get it to go over on the moon's surface. But I think the main thing now is going to be to get the Samayaja 
back down to the Kerbal Space Center and see how that goes. So it's time to close the cargo bay doors and get this thing ready for descent. I left the uh, Communitron um, activated inside there. I'm hoping that it'll be protected from re-entry being inside the uh, cargo bay. If it's not, if it breaks off, of course, I'm going to lose, at least temporarily, uh, communication with this particular or with this vessel but I still do have the DP 10 antenna which normally has a range of 250 kilometers but now actually has been upgraded to a range of 500 kilometers so as I come close to KSC as the KSC comes over the horizon I should be able to regain control again in the worst case scenario and of course we're going to use the trajectories mod to help us plan our uh, plan our descent. We're going to burn retrograde until we get that uh, red cross to be right on the Kerbal Space Center. Now I'm using the flight computer that comes with remote tech to hold the retrograde vector. And the reason why I'm doing that is because the flight computer will continue to execute that instruction even if that communitron happens to uh, break off. And so it'll continue to hold the retrograde um, attitude. I also have these air brakes up towards the top of the vessel that lifts the center of drag above the center of mass that also helps it maintain this particular attitude so hopefully all of this should go pretty well. Yeah and by the way I should mention that I've never tested this. I didn't test this before I recorded this at all. I tested its ascent, its launch, but I never tested its descent. I, if, if I had Goebbels aboard I would definitely want to be testing its ability to land but I thought it might be more fun to kind of wing this like this and right now I'm noticing yeah I'm going to be coming pretty short there uh, in fact I'm gonna be lucky if I clear those mountains so yeah it's a good thing I don't have Kerbals aboard this thing oh uh, yeah so we'll see, we're seeing all this going I'm trying to maintain your keep track of how hot those air brakes get they have a tendency to want to explode and okay why are you spinning you're spinning. I don't like this spinning. I don't see understand what should be causing this to spin. Everything is symmetrical. There shouldn't be anything causing this to spin. This thing's going out of control. Okay, I'm going to turn off the flight computer. Oh, something just broke off. Well, that's not cool. I still have a communication. Okay, so I turned off the flight computer and I just put it on the stock retrograde holding button thing. And I'm trying to maintain control or get control of the roll just using... Um, manually and I'm starting to notice that the roll controls are backwards yeah the roll controls are definitely backwards yeah right is left and left is right I've had this happen before and it has to do with the um, I've had this done when when I have decouplers or uh, docking ports that are upside down and the decoupler that was holding on to the payload was upside down and somehow that sometimes that seems to confuse the issue and confuse the uh, the control system so yeah right is left and left is right so this is getting to be kind of awkward to keep control of and to keep it from spinning uh, it's the SAS that wants to keep it spinning and then I'm fighting it to want it to go back the way I want it to go so that's not cool anyway okay the heating parts all done and nothing seems to have uh, else has broken off so that's good and I still have control and that's good and it looks like I'm clearing the mountains so that's also good and I got some attitude control here. I'm also going to try and use the lift of the rocket itself, the lift of the body to try and uh, carry this as far as I can so I can get as far away from those highlands as I can. So hopefully that will mean I'll land on some relatively flat ground. But right now I'm going pretty good. I should mention that by the way all of this commentary is done post recording. So I actually do know what's going to happen but I'm not going to give anything away I don't want to I want to pretend that I don't know what's happening so I'm holding off uh, releasing the parachutes to the last minute because I want to carry this thing as far away from the mountains as I can so I'm really delaying deploying those parachutes as late as I can are coming down at least at least the attitude control is working pretty easily even though I'm a little bit away from the Kerbal Space Center yeah going down going down getting closer what am I getting close to oh just broke the kilometer mark or release the parachutes slow down slow down oh and I'm not slowing down get those landing gear down and oh oh 
Well, all right, I'm going to call that... <laughs> I'm going to call that a partial success. I, I thought the parachutes would slow that down quicker, uh, but they didn't. So uh, we'll definitely be releasing the parachutes earlier next time. I also never did use my engines to try and slow down. I do have engines on this thing that can help me slow this thing down. Uh, and I completely freaked out and forgot that I had engines. So I could have thrusted to slow myself down. So yeah, I, I, I'm going to call that a partial success. It didn't completely explode. And I think I learned something the next time. Not going to be so bad. Next time I think things are going to go much, much, much better. But that is going to have to be for our future episodes. So we will hope to see you then.